Closed captioning of this program is made possible by the Fireman's Fund Foundation. Students continue their battle over higher education cuts, staging takeovers on two Bay Area campuses while the legislature holds hearings in Sacramento. If you were expecting an upswing in the state's economy next year, don't count on it. The latest economic forecast for California looks mostly cloudy. Efforts to build a stadium for the San Francisco 49ers in Santa Clara hits another snag. And the landscape paintings of Santa Cruz artist Richard Mayhew. Coming up next. Good evening, I'm Belva Davis and welcome to This Week in Northern California. These are some of the stories in the news this week. Assembly Democrats choose first-term Assemblyman John A. Perez as the new speaker. He will be the first openly gay man to hold the post. But the nomination by Governor Schwarzenegger of Abel Maldonado for lieutenant governor has yet to be approved. Former Senator John Burton, head of the state's Democratic Party, vowed that Maldonado, a Republican, would not be confirmed by the Democrat-controlled legislature. California lawmakers are rushing to approve education reform legislation needed to receive up to $700 million from President Obama's race to the top competition. The money is being offered to reform the nation's worst performing schools. But Governor Schwarzenegger prefers a bill passed by the Senate and says that he'll veto a bill passed by the State Assembly late on Thursday. Unemployment checks for more than 100,000 Californians have been delayed, some for more than a month. The state's outdated computer system has not been able to process President Obama's November 6 extension of benefits. About 150 Port of Oakland truckers protested in Sacramento this week. They are required to meet new clean air standards by January 1st, but the $22 million of federal, state, and local funds to help them buy new equipment has run out. The California Air Resources Board added an extension for drivers who can prove, uh, show proof of sales contracts for their equipment by December the 31st. But joining me on our news panel, Howard Mintz, reporter with the San Jose Mercury News, and Tom Abadi staff writer with the San Francisco Chronicle, and Annette Asimov, San Francisco Chronicle education writer. Nanette, let me ask you first of all, were these disruptions on the campuses, um, uh, well, over cuts and, and, uh, and other things that the students are unhappy about, were they really very disruptive? Well, it, it really depends on what campus you're talking about. Um, this week at San Francisco State University, things were pretty disruptive. Thousands of students were displaced from business classes, and they were quite angry about it. Um, and on the UC Berkeley campus, though, they seem to have learned a lesson that uh, that they learned from, I would say, about a month ago when they were disrupting classes and pulling fire alarms and running around the campus, and they angered their fellow students, just as just happened at San Francisco State. So what you saw this week was um, a takeover of Wheeler Auditorium where the students took pride in not disrupting other students but opening the what they called open university and inviting everybody in and they were uh, taking having workshops and lectures on the state's budget crisis which is the reason for these uh, demonstrations in the first place so um, nevertheless today uh, 66 of those students were arrested, and the reason was that tomorrow is uh, finals are to, are scheduled in Wheeler Auditorium at Berkeley, and so the university was um, perhaps rightly afraid uh, that 
tomorrow's finals would be disruptive there because a party was scheduled tonight and it was supposed to continue all evening. So um, they went in and arrested 66 demonstrators and yesterday 25 were arrested at San Francisco State. What about the community colleges? They, have they been quiet or are they, they quiet so far but getting Well, they haven't noisier? taken over buildings yet, so maybe that remains to be seen. But they are very angry on the community college uh, campuses as well and you see demonstrations um, there too just no building takeovers and um, earlier this week um, Jack Scott the Chancellor of the Community Colleges joined Chancellor Reed with CSU and Mark Udoff um, at UC to talk to uh, a joint committee up there and talked about the importance of more money for higher education in California. It seems like it would it would need to reach a critical mass across the state for these demonstrations to have any effect. Is anybody listening and is there any sense that things can <coughs> intensify to a level that it actually might make a difference as opposed yeah. to scattered it, It's activity. a great question. I, I was, you know, I've attended so many of these demonstrations now from UCLA to Berkeley. I was beginning to think somebody really was listening. And, and then I was talking to uh, a few people up in Sacramento and they said, you know, we're sympathetic, but what's it gonna do? The state has a $21 billion budget deficit at this time, and they're just about to start the budget negotiations. The season is about to begin, but everybody needs more money. And so as sympathetic as the student's argument is, uh, higher education is supposed to be free, but there's right. no money. Well, we should go back to say what what has happened yeah. already in terms of pronouncements, at least at the UC system, about an increase in fees and what this could mean in terms of some students maybe not being able to afford to, to attend a university at all. Right, well, 32% fee increase was approved last month by the UC Regents and a similar one uh, at the CSU campus. But um, at UC, if you are a student whose family makes seventy thousand dollars or less and this will be this is a surprise to a lot of students who aren't aware of this they don't pay a tuition so the tuition next year is supposed to climb i'm going to say over eleven thousand when you include all the peripheral fees this is in an education that was supposed to be free according to the master plan but um so Middle class students are really the ones who are going to, uh, you know, suffer these fee increases the most because they're not thoroughly eligible for free tuition the way the lower income students are. It's uh, it's amazing. I just the the sweep. Uh, I came to California in the uh, mid 1970s from another state uh, as a serviceman. I went to UC almost for free. I was talking about yeah. it with my friends. And now it's $11,000 and $11,000 for room and board. It's That's right. suddenly uh, the question of uh, whether or not the state is accessible for higher education becomes real. What are we gonna do? Yeah, well that brings up the master plan and we're right. almost out of time and so we really ought to to say what the dream was. Well, the dream well, maybe still was, is. and still is <laughs> yeah. because it's still on the books. Yes, of course. Uh, Fifty years ago, the master plan said a um, largely free education, free of tuition, peripheral fees will be charged, but this is what everybody will will get in California. And the master plan uh, divided the community college, California State University and UC, and it said, you know, they will be world-class universities, and lo and behold, they really are. And that is what the administrator, the executives, fear now could undermine that dream of uh, continuing excellence at public universities in California. So the students are speaking to the long-term dream. They and, are. And what the system is up against is this huge deficit that is to continue into the future. That's correct. Which means you get to come back here again, I'm sure. I'm sure that's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the future for uh, the state as a whole, and it now is forecast by um, uh, UCLA's uh, Anderson forecast, which they do each year, and it's mm -hmm. a pretty credible forecast, and it didn't seem to have very much good news in it, Tom, for us. No, I, I, I'm afraid not. I'm going to talk about three different letters that are going to dictate the future of the state next year. We're not quite sure which one will come to be. A V, sharp down and sharp up, that would be the best outcome for the state, but I don't think that that will happen. A U, a little square U at the bottom, which went sharply down, we all know, tagging along at the uh, along at, at a low pace, and then coming back up at some future date in a couple of years is perhaps the best we can hope for. And the one we're really afraid of is W, down, up a little bit, down again, 
and back up at some point in the future. We really don't know which of those three scenarios is going to play out. Uh, meanwhile, what we have in every indication is how hard pressed the families of California are in dealing with this. We had a report out from the United Way of the Bay Area looking at a new way of measuring the ability to survive self-sufficiency index, not a poverty index, but really what does it cost for families of different sizes to live in the different locales? Maybe as many as one out of five families really are having a hard time getting by. And we have so many different problems. For instance, uh, we have the huge NUMMI factory uh, set to close, arguments about their severance, and a big argument, a uh, big decision, excuse me, before the federal government underway about whether or not in addition to the 4,700 to 5,000 people who are inside the factory who will get some very generous severance from the uh, federal government, whether another 15 to 20,000 supply workers that will eventually be affected, including some of those truckers, for instance, mm -hmm. at the Port of Oakland, which is a great big uh, part of feeding uh, supplies into the, the factory, whether their uh, unemployment, potential unemployment, will be uh, covered by the same sort of subsidies. That's the thing I wonder about these economic forecasts. I mean, what what are we looking at in terms of employment? That seems to be the thing people care about the most. You hear all, all these numbers get thrown at you that, you know, it's leveled off. Maybe it's the number of jobless has dropped, you know, each month, but it's still more people losing their jobs. I mean, how do you square these forecasts, these, you know, grand big picture scenarios with what the numbers are going to look like for jobs? Well, we, we don't really have a, 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 this is called the dismal science, and I think it's only half correct, dismal being the part that's correct, science being less... Uh, less predictive than one would like. But there's a, there, there have been 10, this is the 11th recession since World War II. Eight of them took the quick V. The last two had more of the U shape. Uh, there was not a strong recovery of either jobs or economic output. So the question is, is there a new normal for economic recoveries? And we'll see. I, I certainly but, uh, can't predict. Well, this Anderson report, tell us which are we mo more likely to see? I mean, is there any hope on the horizon? Well, there's something, I, you know, perhaps the, the problem of knowing a little too much about some of these subjects is you read the whole report, 110 pages, and you find phrases like uh, their own regret about not having called the severity of the downturn, which is a big oops, and saying things like with tongue-in-cheek economic humor, uh, often wrong, but never in doubt. So not great predictors. what are the things California is losing that will cause th this uh, a continued slip and, until a couple of years out? I mean, is it certain industries? Um, well, I think Nanette hit the nail on the head in the whole segment about education. It's a 21st century knowledge economy. Mm -hmm. We're competing with India. We're competing with China. We're competing with Ireland. Ireland, for instance, has built itself into a modern economic miracle with free education. We're forgetting what we taught the rest of the world, and we're making access to education harder for Californians. That's brain dead. Are there some segments that will not recover even in the best of times, do you think? Um, Holly, this is such a varied economy. This is a huge economy. It has everything from nuts to you know, computer chips. Um, I, I think that many parts of the economy will come back. I particularly believe and hope that manufacturing comes back. If it doesn't, uh, things not necessarily NUMMI, but we have Tesla growing up in the southern part of the state. So where something dies, something comes back for California, so and I'm hopeful that much of it will. When? I mean, you have three scenarios, you know, bad, worse, maybe a little better. And it seems so like when? money's not flowing. Right. I mean, in the sense that that was one of the whole ideas behind stimulus, right, is we're going to get money flowing, lending flowing, and I, you don't see You don't it. see that. Yeah, well, that's why the W is to be feared, because right now we're having some sort of a pop here from the Obama stimulus, not necessarily the, the uh, Bush uh, TARP thing, but the Obama stimulus will work through the rest of 2010 although it was a little bit slow. But at the end of that, will there be sufficient confidence in the private sector or not? to keep the thing going. Will it go into a W? Will it go into a, a, a U? Will it okay. go back up? Well, so we've talked about education not having any money. We've talked about the state on downturn. Now we're going to move to something that's close to the hearts of 
many, and that is we're going to talk about stadiums. So <laughs> Howard Metz, who has filed a lawsuit that could further delay a planned stadium for the 49ers down in Santa Clara? Uh, it was, it's a company, Cedar Fair Entertainment, which is the corporate owners of Great America Theme Park, the proposed 49ers stadium in Santa Clara is would be built on a parking lot adjacent to Great America. Um, in the end, the lawsuit probably isn't going to make much difference, and it probably won't be the last lawsuit we see over this development or the ballot language or anything else because that's what happens in these things. But it, it's, it's an indication of the complexity of pulling this deal off. Um, it's, it's what happened this week, what happened today, the 49ers and a group that they're backing, um, finalized paperwork, got it to Santa Clara City Hall to put an initiative on the June ballot. Um, it's going to be up to the voters of Santa Clara whether they want a stadium deal or not, whether they think it's a good deal or not. Interestingly, the language in the ballot initiative is all about um, what a great idea it is for taxpayers and it's an economic boom to the city um, selling True. it as a stimulus yeah. idea. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not about football, it's about money. Um, and is that true, though? You know, the jury's out on that. I mean, um, you know, these stadium deals around the country are always, you know, numbers fly on both sides about whether in the long run it pumps money into the local economy, you know, is, is the mark of a pro football franchise in your city, you know, does that kind of elevate you and pay off in, financially? Um, there are some public contributions in this proje project. Uh, there's redevelopment money. Uh, they're <clears throat> talking about passing a, a hotel tax on guests in the city, which is, you know, one of those that you can kind of, uh, uh, you know, sleight of hand a little bit in the sense that, you know, the taxpayers don't feel it. It's, you know, the guy from Omaha who came in for the football game. Uh, Wait, you, you've talked about the lawsuit. You've talked about the uh, ballot measure by the city council, but there's another ballot measure, right? Well, there is. I mean, these things are never straightforward. The Santa Clara City Council, um, since earlier this year when they, they reached kind of this term sheet deal with the 49ers, has been moving on a track to do all the, take all the legal steps they need to take to put it on the ballot. Everyone agrees, the 49ers agree, they want a binding vote of the Santa Clara community to see whether they want this stadium. And the City Council had been moving on this track and as of last Tuesday had ordered the staff to prepare language for the ballot and so forth and the 49ers in this group stand up and say well we're going to put our initiative on the ballot it's a citizens initiative and one kind of quick side note is that enables them to avoid a lawsuit over the environmental impact report on the project at least in the short run so so it, it was a very clever move the 49ers have a little money to play with, so they're getting good advice from their lawyers and political consultants. So no it's, with all of this, it's a, is this a done deal in terms of the uh, team leaving San Francisco? Is this, it sounds like it's for it, sure. It's, it's not a done deal in the sense, I think if the Santa Clara voters approve this, it's hard to imagine a scenario where the deal falls apart, although again, there's a, you know, you can always pull that you know, thread of yarn and it unravels. But I think if they get the vote, it's pretty clear the team, you know, has a site they like. They've invested a lot of time and money in this that they'd go. The thing is, stadium votes are never slam dunks. They're never runaways. Does um, Silicon Valley have San Francisco envy, do you think? Uh, well, <laughs> they, they, they've always had it a little bit. But if, you know, uh, the, the, the folks who show up at a 49ers game, I, I, don't, I know the 49ers probably know this number by heart. But they're not, you know, half of them are from other, they're from Silicon Valley, they're from Marin, they're from the East Bay. You know, you don't have to be a San Francisco resident to go to right. Candlestick. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, it's, it's more of an identity thing. Um, Who's opposing this? Any group organized? Here? Right now there is a local kind of grassroots group. They've got a website. They're doing all the things you do these days. They're blogging. They're showing up at the city council meeting. They're not showing up in great numbers. But I think they're going to start getting stronger. They'll get some backing. And there's a group, you know, the, the San Francisco has a Lennar, this development group that's looking at developing uh, Hunter's Point. They've included a stadium in that plan. Um, there might be some San Francisco money pumped into the opposition campaign. So I would be shocked if they weren't. For, they're still fighting to keep the, the there, team there's here. There's no question there. There's a very large, powerful group of people who want to keep that team in San and Francisco. Who, who's in Santa Clara? Who are the electorate? 
You know, it's it's a typical hodgepodge of Silicon Valley residents. You have your engineers, you have, you know, your your uh, people who are from other parts of the country. You have your lifelong Santa Clara residents. I mean, Santa Clara has the group that's actually pushing the stadium is a bunch of former city council people and mayors and so forth and chamber of commerce types. Um, so it's it's an eclectic bunch. I mean, it. So they have what San Francisco lacks, a, a community of city leaders who are fighting to get this stadium. Uh, there, there, there is probably a little more cohesion than there is at San Francisco City Hall. Okay, but at least now in June, one way or the other, we'll know. I think that's going to be a big okay. test. Well, my thanks to all of you, Howard, Tom, and to Nanette. The Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco is hosting an exhibition of an artist who's been called one of the most important African-American landscape painters of the 20th century. But that label doesn't accurately describe the breadth of Richard Mayhew's experience and perspective. Our Sparks production team set out to learn more about this remarkable man and his work. Richard Mayhew's dreamlike landscapes are drenched in color. Some are startling, others soft and diffused. They reflect the rich artistic influences that Mayhew has encountered in more than 70 years of studying art in this country and Europe, teaching at academies and universities, observing nature, and painting, always painting. When I'm painting, I'm really in, I'm inside the painting, not outside painting it. I'm really in a trance. In time and space, and while I'm doing it, I have no consciousness of it. I'm just completely lost inside the painting. The Museum of the African Diaspora organized this retrospective of Mayhew's paintings with two other museums, the De Sasse and the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. The exhibits were curated by UC Irvine professor Bridget Cooks. Bridget wanted to do an exhibition on Richard Mayhew given his significance in African American art history. Although we have a broad mission, we also want to focus on local artists and Richard Mayhew is definitely someone that we wanted to have the opportunity to present his work here in San Francisco. Mayhew retired almost 20 years ago from his teaching job at Penn State University. He and his wife, Rosemary, a documentary filmmaker of Native American culture, moved to a cottage near Santa Cruz. California's varied landscapes captivated Mayhew after a cross-country road trip in the 1960s and then teaching at several state colleges. From his deck, he looks out at gentle hills, one of many views that inspires him to paint. When I start painting, I just smear paint on the canvas has no reason at all. It just gets me started. And after I do that, a certain feelings start to take place, and I, and I go, for, go, go, go with it. The image evolves at the moment. So there's no planning in the beginning, and it happens on the canvas. It's that moment of truth. I work on several paintings at a time. Sometimes I feel I'll ruin this painting, and I start to lose it, I'll put it aside and work on the other one. Mayhew's landscapes are imaginary, but they've been inspired by places he's seen and by what he calls an intense emotional and spiritual union with nature. This relationship began when he was a boy growing up on Long Island, where the meadows, marshes, and ocean were his playground. His family was African American and Native American, and his grandmother encouraged his interest in art. She instilled in him the love of nature, and the lore and attitudes of indigenous people. She was Shinnecock Indian, and she really is one that nurtured me in terms of that sensitivity and a spiritual commitment. When he was 14, Mayhew watched a group of artists paint on the beach near his home. One was professional medical illustrator James Wilson Peel, who took Mayhew under his wing and taught him how to draw. 
Mayhew went on to study with some of the great painters of the time, such as Max Beckman, Reuben Tam, and Edwin Dickinson, and immersed himself in New York's art scene. But while others experimented with a new wave of abstract expressionism, Mayhew remained dedicated to landscapes. It's more universal more sensitivity in terms of the spiritual state of existence. So I retained all of that sensitivity and for nature. And uh, so when I paint, I'm reliving all of that experience. And it's not so much actually the uh, landscape itself, it's the emotional encounter with, with nature. Landscape is, is an illusion of reality. And I didn't want to paint the reality I wanted to paint the essence of the reality, and that's very difficult. In 1963, Mayhew joined the Spiral Group, founded by painters Romare Bearden and Norman Lewis, in response to the civil rights struggle. They discussed the plight of blacks in America and the direction African-American art should take. The Spiral Group, they actually discussed that creative consciousness and how it affected American society and how it's involved discrimination. But now I realize the uh, legacy that they've left is unbelievable. And very special people. So they weren't just artists. These were the uh, mentors of the future of American society. The Spiral Group was ahead of its time in anticipating multiculturalism. But Mayhew also took his own path, one that ironically may have kept him from becoming better known in his own community. There's no indication of his ethnicity in this work. I think most people are not familiar with his work because it's not representational of of what black art looks like or artwork by African-American artists. Mayhew feels his work is not African-American or Native American, but multicultural, reflecting all of his life's influences. This should be embraced as beautiful, he says, just like nature itself. You can see how it it starts from nothing. It just evolves, right? There's a whole musical piece there. (laughs) Right here, that's right. Right. You can see it just evolves, it just happens. Well, the Richard Mayhew retrospective at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco has just been extended through March 7, 2010. That's all for tonight. Be sure to visit our website at kqed.org slash thisweek and tell us what you think are the biggest stories of 2009 for our year-end program. You can also watch complete episodes and segments and sign up for our newsletter, subscribe to our podcast, and comment on the show. I'm Belva Davis. Good night. Major funding for Spark on This Week in Northern California is provided by Diane B. Wilsey. Additional funding provided by the George Frederick Jewett Foundation, Helen Sarah Steyer, and Fred Levin and Nancy Livingston of the Shenson Fund.